Amen. Well, to get things started here for teaching time, I need to know, like, who, like, you really, really, really like donuts? Like, you like donuts so much, you would like to have one right now. Like, there's one person? Really? That's... Okay, Ed, Ed, are you going to be my guy? You raised your hand. So, okay, I'm coming down to you. Here you go, bud. So, I have some donuts for you. Here's the deal. You take that. I only have chocolate and glaze, or chocolate cake and glaze. You pick your favorite one, whichever one's your favorite. Okay, here's the deal, dude. You have to sit down. Thank you. Um, and you have to hold that on your lap the whole time. And if you hold that the whole time and don't eat it, I have this box and a gift certificate for you. So you have to hold on to that, okay? So be good, be good. Well, today, um, it is good to be back uh, here after a couple-week vacation. It was, uh, uh, by the way, didn't like Phil and Amber and Johnny just knock it out of the park the last three weeks? That was, that was incredible. Yeah, yeah. You know, they have they've did so well. I've been reduced to giving away donuts to try to, you know, get warmth and people to like me again. So, uh, no, they, did, they knocked it out. It was great. We, we were able to listen to a couple of them while we were on vacation. And it was great being back last Sunday and being able to worship and hear uh, Johnny live while we were, we were here. Good stuff. We had a great vacation. Um, you know, as we were, we were starting our vacation, we, were, we learned really quick about a concept called Patience. You, you've heard of patience, I'm sure. Um, we get a, we we pick the kids up from school the last day of school, May 31st. We hit the road. We're taking 33. We're getting ready to turn to catch a connecting road to get onto the bridge that will take us to I-77. And as we're getting ready to turn, a sheriff's car pulls up, blocks the road, and says, "I-77 is shut down due to an accident. You're going to, have to take a detour." And I'm like, "Ah, oh, man." So we turn, and, and Jill, that's, that's who we affectionately call our Google Map voice, this young lady that's the Google Map lady, and she goes, a quicker way, uh, for a quicker way, route, take uh, a left. So we take a left, and it's down this like crazy country road. Everybody else is going on the main detour. We probably get like five roads backwoods somewhere southern Ohio near the river. We have no idea where we're at. We're just hoping Jill's right, you know? Um, and then, like, as, you know, I'm thinking, man, we're just starting this trip. We're going to do a detour, and, you know, we're going to try to make it five hours tonight and then get up early and finish the rest of the way to a beach south of, of Daytona. And, like, man, it's going to be long. What's going on? And then all of a sudden it hits me that I probably should have taken a restroom break before we left. Um, <laughs> And I start calculating the ounces I've had. Like I've had like three coffees and five major sports bottles that I keep filling up and drinking water and, and a blood pressure pill. And, uh, and so I start running scenarios like, man, there, there was some traffic on these back roads because I think other people were taking it for the detour. Um, Jill was taking them there too. She wasn't just exclusive to us. And I'm thinking of scenarios where maybe I could run up to somebody's house and say, you know, excuse me, sir. And I th then I'm running scenarios of somebody greeting me going, boy, you ain't from around here. I'm like, nah, I don't want to do that. And so we finally get onto a main road and we turn and I can tell from the map we're like three miles from I-77. Like, yes. And so we, we are... Um, uh, we're booking it. We're doing well. That first mile, we come around a corner and traffic is dead stop. Took us 45 minutes to go two miles. I'm doing this as I'm driving. <laughs> I'm literally playing scenarios. I bet, because we would just stop and just sit for a while. I'm thinking, I could jump out. Christy could switch places. And then I could go behind a building and then come back. And I'm thinking, and then I get arrested. Then I'm in the paper. You know, I mean, there's all these things that are going through my head. <laughs> Thank God we made it uh, to I-77 to a place to go. But, like, we were just an hour or two into it, and then another stoppage happened on 77. And the next day we had several. And there was all kinds of opportunities to practice patience, particularly when I was in the left lane. And somebody, like 10 cars ahead, is in the left lane and has the audacity to go to the speed limit and was holding us up. And <laughs> would you just get over, you know, and patience. You know, we as a society aren't built for patience. Are you being patient, Ed? You doing okay? Yeah, yeah. Smell it for me. We just, how's that thing smell? Pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Be patient. We are not bred for patience, are we? I mean, our society of fast food, microwave uh, uh, ovens, and now, you know, these things that we have, I mean, you get in a line for any longer than like a nanosecond and, and you're pulling this out. We have to be stimulated. Like we can't, we can't just wait. Waiting is tough, isn't it? Now, for some of us, we're not just waiting for the end of a service so we can get, you know, 
half a dozen donuts, eat the one that's in front of us, and get a, a gift card to Gypsy Joe's. Some of us are waiting on some stuff that's pretty deep and pretty important. Like you may be waiting to get pregnant with, with, a, with a child. Um, you may be waiting on uh, retirement and counting the days. You, you may be um, waiting for medical test results to come through or, or waiting for a procedure to be finished and you to recuperate from that. Or maybe you're waiting for just a promise that God gave you, either through the Word, through the Scriptures, or just as you were praying or somebody gave you a word that you really sensed with the Lord. You're waiting for a promise to come. Waiting can be difficult, can't it? Now, for others of us, the patience isn't so much as directed at an event to happen. It's directed towards people like a difficult spouse and you're having to be patient. An annoying coworker, um, You know, uh, some other person in your life that's distressing or oppressing you. Uh, maybe it's being patient with the terrible twos. Or maybe it's patience with the terrible 22s or 32s or however old your child is. Um, Patience can be difficult. Today I want to answer the question, how can we be patient people? And this is pretty important. Why is it important to, to learn how to be patient? For one thing, the world would be a whole lot better if we were patient people, right? Think about how better your family would be if every family member was patient with one another. Uh, think about how, much your, how better your drive would be on the 33 commute if you were a patient driver. Other people were patient as they drove. Uh, think about politicians, if they were patient with one another, and instead of just lobbing sound bites at one another, they actually were patient and waited and tried to get something done. Or, or imagine if nations would just be a little more patient and maybe not go to war. I mean, patience is important, isn't it? And that's just the practical reasons, but there's a whole other reason that makes it important. If you claim to be a follower of Christ, you have this, you have this label on you, and it's Christian. It means to be Christ-like, and if Christ was anything, he was patient. I mean, he only spoke words at just the right time. He was patient. He was patient with his disciples, a bunch of lunkheads that were always failing and, and just saying the most stupid stuff, and, and he was patient, you know, patient with his tormentors on the cross. We're honest. Christ is pretty patient with us too, isn't he? You think about all that we've done, all that we've said, the times we've denied him by words or actions, and yet Christ has been patient. So it's incredibly important that we learn to be patient like Christ. That's who we're called to be. It's Christ like. So to answer these questions, we're going to actually look at the Bible. We're going to look at a story and a couple other verses. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2. And I'll set this up. We are in the midst of the Power Up series. It's not just an excuse to decorate with 8-bit and 16-bit video game uh, things so that uh, those of us who are over 40 feel nostalgic. It actually has a purpose, and that purpose is we are powering up with the Holy Spirit. And so in June, we're focused on powering up with the fruit of the Spirit, like we've already heard about love and joy and peace. And, and uh, in July, we're going to learn about how to power up with the Holy Spirit in gifts and hearing His voice and seeing healings and those kind of things and so we're in the midst of this power up series and so today we want to learn how we can power up with patience we're going to look at a story in Luke chapter 2 Jesus was born in this story he was born eight days earlier his parents were taking him to the temple to be dedicated which is what every good Jewish family did so they took their their kids to the temple eight days in to have them dedicated so they're going there and we're going to come across two incredibly patient people and we're going to find out how we can be patient too so take a look Luke chapter 2 and uh, let's start with verse 34 Actually, let's start a little earlier. Let's go up to uh, 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. Waiting for the consolation of Israel. He, it's a phrase that means he's waiting for God to save Israel, for God to send the Messiah, the Savior, the Deliverer to the world. And it says the Holy Spirit was on him. Now what's interesting about this phrase, particularly in the original Greek that it was written in, is when it says the Holy Spirit was on him, it wasn't like a one-time thing or a seasonal thing, which is how you always see the Holy Spirit on people in the Old Testament. 
This is different. It, it means the Holy Spirit was continually on him, which is very, very rare in the scriptures, particularly before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. After that, that language is all over the place. But before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, um, you don't see this language. So the Holy Spirit is continually on Simeon, and he's waiting. It had been revealed by the whole, to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was custom of the law required, Simeon took him, took Jesus, into his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, the glory of your people Israel." The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. So Simeon, we don't know how long he's been waiting, but it had been revealed to the Holy Spirit at some point earlier in his life, you will not die until you get to see God's Messiah, the Savior. So he has been waiting, and the Holy Spirit is on him, and he's been waiting. And, and that particular day, he felt the unction of the Holy Spirit. He felt a nudge, a move that you need to be at the temple, and this is such and such a place, this such and such a time, so that you can see what I promise. And he goes, and lo and behold, I mean, who knows how many babies were there that particular day, or how many people were, but God like enlivened his eyes and he saw that this was no ordinary baby. This indeed was the Messiah. And so he goes and responds and he gets to see what God had promised. Now jump down a couple of verses. Verse, let's take 36. There was somebody else waiting. There was also a prophet, actually a prophetess. Pretty rare and unusual. This is more language of like God is doing something new during this new era. There's something happening. After 400 years of silence, God is moving again among his people. And the rabbis only recognized seven women in all of the Old Testament up until this point as prophetesses. And now we're finding there's another one. And her name's Anna. The daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher, she was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. She was probably, like most girls back then, married as a young teenager, maybe 12, 13, 14, or 15. She lived seven years with her husband, but yet he died, and then as a widow until she was 84. She'd been alive a long time as a widow. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying, Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So we have another person who's been waiting at the temple since she became a widow. She's been waiting for God to do something, for God to reveal the Messiah from, from maybe 20 or 22 to, to now 84 years old. She's been waiting and praying, and she gets to see... God bring Messiah into the, into the world. Now that's, that's patience. Anyway, you cut that. That's patience. To continually, day and night, join with the community of God, worship, pray, and fast, and just wait until you can see the Messiah for yourself. Has God ever given you a promise that you've been waiting on? Maybe in Scripture. Maybe through prayer. How long did you have to wait? These people apparently waited a long time. And then if we're talking about their ancestors, they had been waiting centuries for this to happen. They were patient people. Now, how did they become patient people? Well, like I said, we're in this series called Power Up, and it's, it's all stemming from a passage in Galatians, Galatians 5, 22 through 25, and... It says that uh, before that verse, actually, uh, we won't look at it, but before those verses, Paul says, an early Christian leader, Paul, he says that when you try to do stuff on your own, the works of your sinful nature, the, the, the human endeavors, if it's all just human power, he says, here's what human power produces in you. Lying and cheating and greed and sexual immorality and, and thievery and debauchery and, and slandering other people and gossiping. That's like when we just do our best and we're going to try out in my flesh, in my human power, my human endeavor, I'm going to try to produce something. He says, if it's just all us, this is what gets produced. But then he says, here's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes into a person and has an endeavor and begins to produce something. 
produces fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. He says, people who are led by the Spirit, who walk in the Spirit, who are filled with the Spirit, this kind of fruit automatically gets produced in them. So we're beginning to to answer our question, how do we become patient people? Is it going to be because we're going to say, I'm I'm just going to grip my teeth and I'm going to choose to be patient? Has that ever worked for anybody, by the way? Like, I'm just going to be patient. I'm really going to work this week on being patient. I'm just going to grip my teeth and be patient. It very rarely works, right? Like, I just become more impatient. I just recognize how often I have to wait. I didn't even realize I had to wait. I didn't know I had to wait for that, but I'm always waiting for that. Why am I waiting? I need to be more patient. Uh, you know, it never works, does it? See, the secret is, it's not a fruit of human endeavor. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the presence of God being in your life. And these fruit are produced in a person who just simply waits on the presence of God and is filled with the presence of God, and this stuff happens. Now, does it just ha- happen automatically? Like you, you, you know, cross your legs and go, mm, and all of a sudden, like, fruit pops out, you know? Like, if I had that happen, Joel, once. I had to get surgery for that growth. No, no, I'm not talking about that. Like, it doesn't happen just automatically. Like, fruit comes out. You actually do get to do something, and you know what you get to do? Like, You get to be led by the Spirit. You get to walk in the Spirit. You get to position yourself to a place where you get to receive from the Holy Spirit. So there is work for you to do. It isn't the kind of work that is, I'm just going to grip my teeth and work and work and work and become a patient person. The work you and I get to do is we get to choose to be led by the Spirit. Now, how do I know that, that, that it isn't passive? That, that, that it's not just automatic, that there is actually something for you to, even though you can't produce patience, you can do something to put yourself into a position to be filled with the presence of God, and then patience will be produced in your life by him. How do I know that? Well, the reason I know that's true is because every time one of these fruit is mentioned in the New Testament, there's always a command or an imperative statement made. Like, you have to do this. Even here in the fruit of the Spirit, Right? He says it's fruit of the Spirit. It's the Spirit that does this. But did you notice that at the end of it, he says, this is what it's like for those who are led by the Spirit or who walk. That's a command. You're supposed to be led by the Spirit, under the control of the Spirit, be surrendered to the Spirit. So that's what you can do. You can actually choose to surrender to the Holy Spirit to, uh, to every, every time the Spirit gives you a nudge, you go yes to the Holy Spirit, or you position yourself to be filled with the Holy Spirit regularly, and the promise of God is this, as you are filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, walk in the Holy Spirit, then the fruit of the Holy Spirit will be produced in your life. And that includes patience. Take a look at back where we were at. I think it's verse 37 here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Anna. She's the, she's the widow who's worshiping until she's 84. And look at the second part of verse 37. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. How did Anna become a patient person to wait until she saw the promise of God? Well, she was in the temple. She was in community with other people seeking God. She was worshiping. She was praying and fasting. Anna was doing what she could do so that she could do what she couldn't do on her own. See, she could choose to be in community. She could choose to worship. She could choose to pray. She could choose to fast. She couldn't necessarily choose to be patient on her own. Why? Because, again, that's a fruit of the who? Holy Spirit. It's not the fruit of Anna. It's not the fruit of humans. We already know what the fruit of of humans is, right? It's all that bad stuff. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is patience, one of them anyway. She couldn't produce that, but what she could do is position herself. She did what she could do on her own, which is worship, pray, fast, be in community. She could do those things in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit so she could do what she couldn't do on her own, which is be patient. It was pressing into the presence of God that grew the patience of God in Anna. To get that? She did what she, couldn't, she could do in order to do what she couldn't do. That's all spiritual disciplines are anyway. You and I have a choice 
Am I going to be a spirit-led, spirit-filled Christian or not? We do have that choice. And we can do it by some of those things she was doing. Worshiping, praying, fasting, being in community, spiritual disciplines. As we do what we can do, we will receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. And when we receive the filling of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is produced in us. Pressing into the presence of God grows the patience of God in me. Do you get that? Pressing into the presence of God grows the patience of God in me. I probably ought to back up just a little bit here because I haven't even defined really patience, have I? Now, when patience is mentioned in the fruit of the Spirit, if some of you are old school and you have like a King James Version, it probably has a better translation. It's one of those instances where it has a better translation. And the translation is long-suffering, forbearance. And the key is, and I think one of the reasons long-suffering and forbearance is a good way to translate patience is because the word patience, when we use it, we think of it as an internal thing, right? Um, Like, I just got to be more patient in this situation or this circumstance. But the word patience in the New Testament, forbearance, long-suffering, it is explicitly saying this is about externals, not just internals. This is about externals, meaning you are being patient with another person. You are, you are uh, bearing with another person. And really, the person who defines that is the character of God. Like, who has been more patient than God? Think of all the bad you've done and I've done been incredibly patient think about all the evil that's done in this world and he could just do this be done and he's been patient one of the early church leaders that used to persecute christians used to murder christians his name was paul he would say i am the chief of sinners in fact i think we have that scripture first timothy 1 6 but for that very reason i was shown mercy so that in me the worst of sinners christ might display his immense patience As an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Later Paul would write, or do you show contempt? He was talking about people who would judge other people. Would say, oh, they're not very good. Or they're evil. Or they have a bad background. Or they're from a pagan background. We're better. We're from a righteous background. He says, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience? Not realizing God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. See, God has been kind. And he's he's had forbearance. And he's had patience on us. That's why it's his fruit and not our fruit. The source of patience is God. So that's why when you press into his presence, you get more of God in you, the more he begins to transform you into his likeness. And one of the attributes that will begin to happen in your life is patience. I came across a quote. I don't even know if it's a powerful quote. I just want to say the, fir- the, the word in the quote. It says, the power of fructification. I've never used fructification in a teaching in my whole life. I don't think I knew it existed until I read it this week. The power of fructification is not to the believer, but to the spirit, this author wrote. This fruit of the spirit, in this case today, patience, it is only going to be produced as we press into the presence of God. And the more we are filled with God, the more we're filled with Holy Spirit, the more we'll begin to produce this fruit. The antidote to rage and, and anger is the presence of God filling us up so that patience can be produced in our lives. That's the antidote. If you want to be a patient person, don't pray for patience. I think it's fine to pray for patience. I know there's that old adage that says you shouldn't. You pray for any fruit you want. It's a gift from God. It's a good thing. Pray for it. But I think what you'd be better off doing, instead of saying make me a patient person, I would think you'd be better off pressing into the presence of God and say, fill me with your presence, Lord. Fill me more and more with you. And the more you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the more the fruit of the Spirit, including patience, is going to naturally be produced in your life. And it's the kind of patience that's going to have practical effects in your life. Scholar and Jesus lover uh, Gordon Fee says this. He says, the power of the Holy Spirit not only produces joy and miracles in the believer, but the power of the Holy Spirit can also 
help you put up with annoying people in your life. That's miraculous, man. I mean, joy is one thing, you know, seeing somebody get healed, awesome. But to be able to put up with annoying people, that's truly miraculous. That's what the Holy Spirit can do. How do you become a patient person? Pressing into the presence of God grows the patience of God in me. Now, this has practical applications in everyday life. So, for instance, um, obviously, one of the things you could do is just simply choose to be in community with believers. You could choose to be a person who worships not only on Sundays, but creates worship space throughout your week. Um, You could uh, pray. You could fast. Any other spiritual disciplines. Do what you can do in order to to be able to do what you can't do. So do what you can do to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to continually be led, to say yes, to surrender to the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the presence of God so that what grows out of you is the patience of God. So you can do that every day, those kind of things. Again, I would spend my time not so much praying for patience as I would saying, God, fill me up, fill me up. And then maybe I would say, okay, as you fill me up, grow that fruit, Lord. I need to be patient in this situation. Do that. In fact, I think practically, the next time you're in a grocery store and the sign says between five and seven, all lanes will be open and they have one lane open and the cashier's a trainee and it's 530 and the line's huge, you could use that moment to say, Fill me up. You could just say, make me patient, make me patient. I'm going to be a patient person. We know how that's going to turn out. Or you could say, you know what, God? Fill me with the Holy Spirit right now. I want to be spirit-led. Grow this fruit in me right now. You know? Who knows? You may actually start choosing the longer line just so you have that opportunity. You know, later down the road. You can just say, I'm going to choose the longest line so that I have an opportunity to be filled with the Holy Spirit and grow patience in me. Or on that 33 commute, When people are weaving in and out and somebody cuts in front of you and gives you the one finger salute, you could cuss a lot and shake your fist. That's not going to help anything. You could say, make me patient, Lord, and that's probably not going to happen right then. Or you could simply use it as a place where you say, you know what, I'm going to say yes to the Holy Spirit. I want to be a person who is pressing into the presence of God and filled with the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, would you fill me up right now? I I yield to you, I surrender to you, I want to be filled more with you because I know the more I'm filled with you, the more fruit of the Spirit, in this case patience, is going to be grown in my life, right? If it's a terrible two or a terrible 22 that you're dealing with, same thing. You could simply press into the presence of God and then be filled with the Holy Spirit And you'll get all kinds of other things, wisdom on how to deal with it and all this kind of thing. But one of the things that will happen, the more you're filled with the presence of God, the more patient you're going to be. That's going to be a fruit that's going to get born in your life automatically. Not automatically because you're a Christian, automatically because you choose to press into the presence of God. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Pressing into the presence of God grows the patience of God in me. So it looks like we have a winner down here. And uh, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter your reward. There you go. And there's a gift card on top of there. Very good. Did a good job, didn't he? He waited. He waited throughout this long teaching in order to get his reward. That's a pretty good illustration of patience, but it's not a complete illustration of what I'm trying to say, of pressing into the presence of God grows the patience of God in me, because here's the deal. If you and I would choose to do this, we don't have to wait for the reward. Because I'm here to tell you the reward isn't this over here. It isn't that you get patience eventually, or you get what you were waiting for. The reward starts immediately. Because the reward isn't the patience, the reward is the presence. I don't care how long you have to wait for this thing to take place, whatever promise, whatever thing you're waiting on, I don't care how long that takes, this isn't the reward. The reward starts from second 
one when you and I choose to press into the presence of God because it's his presence that's the reward. You get that? So there's a benefit from doing this from right now. You don't have to wait till like eventually fruit gets produced and hey, I got some fruit here, you know? You, you get the reward right here. At the presence of God. Pressing into his presence is the reward. But it's got a great benefit. It grows all kinds of fruit. And one of those that will be grown in your life is patience. Since that's true, why don't we press into the presence of God right now and get the reward of more of him flowing, okay? Can we just, let's just wait. I'm going to have Ryan come up. He's going to lead us in some worship. But can we just wait on the Lord for a couple moments here? Come, Holy Spirit, right now.